Hi, everyone. We're going to wait for a few more people to trickle in. So thanks for joining us, and we will start momentarily. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're excited to welcome uh, Dr. Elizabeth Edwards Spaulding, and we will start in just a minute as soon as a, a few more people trickle in very shortly. Hello and welcome to uh, the, our talk tonight. We're really excited to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Edwards Spaulding. Um, the lecture that she's gonna give tonight is part of the Benson Center's Community or Disunity series. And the series that runs all this academic year invites speakers and students and faculty uh, to reflect on questions related to the communities we build and the challenges that might contribute to their disintegration. So Dr. Spaulding is an excellent candidate for this series. She is a senior fellow at Pepperdine University School of Public Policy. And she's the author of some really interesting books. The first Cold Warrior, Harry Truman, Containment and the Remaking of Liberal Internationalism. And she's the co-author of A Brief History of the Cold War. Her scholarly and popular articles uh, have been published in all kinds of outlets, the Journal of Church and State, Orbis, Providence, uh, the great online journal Law and Liberty. Um, and she's taught on all sorts of subjects in US foreign policy, national security, uh, international relations, you know, presidential leadership, religion and politics, and, and this at Pepperdine and at Claremont uh, McKenna College and uh, at George Mason University, Catholic University of America. And she serves on the board of trustees of the victims uh, for the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. And she earned her PhD uh, at one of my favorite universities, Thomas Jefferson's great university, uh, the University of Virginia. 
in political theory, which is uh, one of the great subfields and one of Thomas Jefferson's favorites. So uh, double kudos to her. But at any rate, the talk of her title tonight is At Home and Abroad, Forms of Community in Foreign Relations. So with that introduction, Elizabeth, take it away. We're excited to hear from you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And it is good to be with you all. Uh, this is not my first time speaking at the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization at the University of Colorado Boulder. Several years ago, I was invited to participate in a panel uh, by the then Benson Center visiting scholar in conservative thought and policy, Bob Kaufman, a good friend, teacher, and scholar. Do you remember those seemingly long ago days when we were able to meet in person? I had a good time and I saw the campus and Boulder and spent time with attendees at the panel who asked excellent questions and who praised the Benson Center for its commitment to free speech, the unfettered exchange of ideas and the enduring truths of Western civilization. And so I was very pleased to accept the invitation from John Eastman, the current Benson Center Visiting Scholar in Conservative Thought and Policy, and Elizabeth Eastman, the Benson Center Senior Scholar, to give a talk in this year's lecture series and to return to the Benson Center and Boulder, even if virtually. Uh, and I thank John Eastman and Elizabeth Eastman, good friends, teachers, and scholars, for their commitment to free speech and the unfettered exchange of ideas, and for their dedication to the principles of the American founding and the enduring truths of Western civilization. What a time, an important time to ponder this year's topic, community and disunity. So my talk this evening, as, as Shiloh mentioned, is uh, entitled At Home and Abroad, forms of community in American foreign relations. And I propose to start with the present, look back a bit to the past, and then re return to the present and look ahead to the future. Just last week, the theme of President Joe Biden's inaugural address was, not surprisingly, unity. Like many new presidents, he said very little directly about foreign policy in his speech. Ideas about America permeated his speech and ideas about America have consequences in US foreign policy. The sacrifices made by American armed forces were referenced and the troops were prayed for. More specifically, Biden promised that we can make America once again, the leading force for good in the world, that we will repair our alliances and engage with the world once again and that will lead not merely by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. He looked forward to writing the story that America has secured liberty at home and stood once again as a beacon to the world. In his list of what tests us most at this time, President Biden included a climate in crisis and America's role in the world. What might all this mean for America in its current approach to foreign relations and its formulation of foreign policy? Hold that question while we talk about first principles and go back in time for a bit. America is based on first principles and I believe other speakers in this year's lecture series have elaborated on this point. America is thus uniquely constructed, even though it is also in other senses, one nation state among many. America's principles are both an expression of and an appeal to what is self-evidently and universally true. America's foundations and the institutions that proceed from these foundations have been tested and still hold. American principles and institutions have inspired and even informed other peoples and other countries' efforts for over two centuries. America's principles are not exercised in a vacuum. And in foreign relations, the United States has to interact 
act toward, act against, act with, act in response, act in anticipation with other state and non-state actors each day in many ways. Such interactions would be enough to keep any nation occupied. And of course they do. These interactions stem from the necessity of national defense. The fundamental and unavoidable responsibility of any country is national defense. Thus, in combination with the regime's first principles, national defense directs every aspect of a country's foreign policy, of its conduct in international relations. National security should focus a country's attention. Life and death, peace and war are the ultimate stakes. National defense should bring people together. In domestic politics, it should offer the largest space for community. There is an immediate tension though that emerges in world politics, which may seem harsh. What offers the largest space for community can deter community out in the world. Any community that develops in the world grows up and out of the sum of each and every nation state's core unavoidable need to defend itself. This includes the good, the bad, and the ugly. Men are not angels and neither are the nations they run. If all regimes were representative liberal democracies, community might have better prospects. In the end though, community at large in the world differs from community at home. Now to our theme of community specifically. Community has many layers in the American experience. Think for a moment on the roots and beginnings. The founders drew on both secular and sacred principles, beliefs, history, and traditions. The founders were well-versed in the ancient understanding of community, especially from the Greeks. For these ancients, community is part and parcel of the polis, which essentially combines state and society. Their regime as a whole embraces the way of governing, the way of living, the kinds of rules and mores. The founders also drew on the Judeo-Christian understanding of community in which the members of said community are tied together by shared beliefs, including about eternity, shared goals, including for eternity, and shared traditions. Add to this Tocqueville's deep treatment of community in democracy in America, which shows commonalities across the land, as well as distinctions across sections of the land. Over time, American community developed as the population grew, experiences broadened, and the land expanded. This experience pertains to America. Other countries have their own experiences of community and peoples in totalitarian and authoritarian countries are of course denied what we Americans would call real community. Community walking hand in hand with the common good is an important end of politics. Justice properly understood leads us to this conclusion. In assessing community, we need to keep in mind that size matters. By our standards, the ancient Greek polis, the city-state was small, which was one of its many unifying factors. Since then, mankind has gone on to create nation states, not just city-states. And some of these nation states have a sense of community. What I am pointing to here is the connection between regime and community. Ultimately, this connection cannot be imposed and community works best in a republic or liberal democracy in a representative form of government. In cases of monarchy and certainly of tyranny, there is not a real sense of community. The American experiment in politics, so striking in other areas, is again striking here. The people, as citizens, participate in building and sustaining community 
Thus, the exceptionalism associated with America for good and for ill connects to a community that has meant something real and substantive. Note, I do not say perfect, but real and substantive. That said, community at a national level, what we Americans tend to connect to civic duty and patriotism as citizens of a representative liberal democracy is ultimately qualified in comparison to that at the family and local levels. There is a community that is more personal and fuller with smaller units, starting with the individual and his family, then neighborhood, then other mediating institutions and organizations that bring individuals together, and then on from there. Once we get to the state and then nation state levels, we see a sum total that was built and is sustained from the ground up. But perhaps counterintuitively, that sum total is somewhat removed from where it began and where it is strongest. Thus, community in a nation state can be very real, but also somewhat comparatively diluted. Now, go global. It does not and cannot work the same way when you get too big, let alone global. Many IR theorists have referred to and even championed world community. And in the past, there were times that the bond of moral obligation from, for example, a major world religion informed commitments that went beyond a nation or beyond a tribe. The nature of the modern world adds impediments. There are not only regime differences, especially between democratic and authoritarian governments, but also an increased sense of personal and group autonomy and the negative effects of technology. We also do not speak of international culture, customs, and traditions as we do at the national, local, and family levels. Interdependence and lack of connection exist at the same time. So despite references to the international, world, or global community, it is not community in the same way as at the respective family, local, and national levels. We can speak of relationships, and we do so in foreign policy. And there can be close relationships, such as the historic Anglo-American relationship. Some alliances can form relationships, as with NATO. But note that to the extent these relationships are or border on friendship, they do so because they are based on essential things held in common, especially politics and strategy, which inform a shared understanding of threats and challenges of what to fight for and what not to fight for. In the case of the traditional Anglo-American relationship, there is also significant shared history and shared commitment to the rule of law and constitutionalism. In terms of US foreign policy at home and abroad, the story about community has always been more complicated than some might want it to be. And here I would like to offer three brief examples from the past, one cautionary and two that were much more successful. First, President Woodrow Wilson. Ironically, although the very term Wilsonian suggests cosmopolitan and communitarian, Wilson ended up undercutting community at home and abroad. After World War I, the Great War, the war to end all wars, Wilson was most determined to keep his League of Nations pure. He decided that he had to be in charge of all debate about the international organization during and after the war. He not only fought his main Republican Party opponents, famously Senator Henry Cabot Lodge regarding reservations to the Versailles Treaty, but he also alienated potential GOP allies, especially former president William Howard Taft. At the same time, Wilson lost many of his progressive Democratic Party supporters who were excluded from his inner circle and found the League of Nations insufficiently idealistic and the peace treaty 
to punitive. With respect to treaty negotiations uh, themselves, Wilson alienated his key cabinet members and closest advisors, Colonel Edward House and Secretary of State Robert Lansing, who wanted latitude to help behind the scenes and who were concerned about how Wilson would interact or not with European leaders. Wilson also alienated those who should have been his strongest allied supporters. French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau often agreed with Wilson, but still said of him, the good Lord himself required only 10 points. Wilson has 14. To Colonel House, Clemenceau said, you are practical, but talking to Wilson is something like talking to Jesus Christ. Back home, Wilson tried to build community for the League of Nations through an intensive and exhausting speaking tour that would cover 8,000 miles in 22 days. Unfortunately, its main effect was to lead to the stroke that left Wilson unable to fully carry out his presidential duties, although he remained in office for the rest of his term. Next, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <clears throat> FDR had served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy in Wilson's administration and consciously sought to avoid his predecessor's missteps. To build community in foreign relations, he made use of private organizations such as the Council on Foreign Relations and the United Nations Association to help mobilize public opinion. The latter organization, with FDR's full approval, sent volunteer bipartisan congressional teams out on the road to promote the future of United Nations to the American people. At night, the bipartisan team of a congressman and senator would even bunk together in the same hotel room. Roosevelt also relied on Wendell Wilkie, the 1940 GOP presidential nominee to deliver Republican backing for liberal internationalism. Wilkie helped the president to pass Lend-Lease in 1941 to send supplies to Great Britain and other allies. And he made two wartime foreign trips as FDR's informal envoy. Both Roosevelt's Secretary of War and Secretary of the Navy were Republicans. Abroad, in terms of community, FDR never lost focus on the post-war world as he fought World War II. He worked closely with allies. A, no a notable example is the Atlantic Charter of basic common principles for a post-war world that was forged on a US Navy cruiser with staunch ally, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. These same allies, Churchill among them, often wished that Roosevelt would commit more and earlier in the Second World War. And like some domestic supporters, were at times frustrated by FDR's vague language and commitments in the background. Finally, President Harry S. Truman. Truman not only faced the end of World War II, but also the beginning of the Cold War. In private meetings and in public statements, and with the help of well-chosen people and his administration, he obtained broad bipartisan consensus for his containment policies. Truman started with secretaries of war who were Republicans and ended his administration with a secretary of defense who was a Republican. He selected General George C. Marshall, known as the organizer of victory in World War II and whom Truman called the great one of the age as his secretary of state. Marshall was in his own words, the ultimate nonpartisan and operated above the political parties. Meanwhile, Marshall's undersecretaries, the latter of whom was Republican, worked tirelessly behind the scenes with key members of Congress. Truman depended on Senator Arthur Vandenberg to foster GOP support for a new liberal internationalism and the strategy of containment. And his administration helped him continue a relationship that had begun when the president himself was a US Senator. As well, Truman never forgot about explaining the nature and meaning of the Cold War and forming public support 
for his policies. Abroad, Truman is the poster child for forming community with allies. And he, with his administration, was responsible for the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, and NATO. We refer to this time under Truman as the golden age of bipartisanship. The golden age was brief, but it shows that it can be done. Politics stops at the water's edge. This is another saying that is associated with both Arthur Vandenberg and the golden age of bipartisanship. Politics stops at the water's edge does not mean that there are no politics involved before reaching the water's edge. After the fact in memoirs and other accounts, the principles of the 1940s talked about where they agreed and disagreed before foreign policy was put forward publicly. Overall, this saying though means that the United States presented itself as a community to the world in its articulation and defense of America, the free world and the West and led in building what became a great alliance against communist totalitarianism. This great Western alliance against communist totalitarianism followed a great wartime alliance against fascism, national socialism, and imperialism. Stunningly to many, at least at the beginning, one of the great allies in the first great alliance became our great foe in the Cold War. Unity was never complete. Unity was also attacked. At home, there were naysayers, including leading progressive and former FDR vice president, Henry Wallace, and some congressional critics who kept voicing their opposition. They disrupted community at home, which also got coverage abroad, in turn promoting elements of disunity in the West. But this was a minority opinion in the end. There were multiple times in the history of the Cold War when the Great Western Alliance was deemed broken or dead, but it kept repairing and reviving itself. At the height of the nuclear freeze movement in the 1980s, when it seemed that the communists and their supporters, both witting and unwitting, might prevail in Europe, NATO held. President Ronald Reagan and the United States, working hand in hand with key allies, especially British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, and French President Francois Mitterrand, deployed Pershing II and cruise missiles against Soviet SS-20s that were directly targeting Western Europe. To build community in foreign policy, agreement on threat assessment is needed. In the United States, the president first and foremost needs to see and understand and then explain and educate. This is what FDR did in World War II, a hot war, and what Truman did in the Cold War, which of course had smaller but significant hot wars within it and always had the potential to erupt in an overall large hot war. What about threat assessment today? And is there general agreement? If not, can there be? We live in a world where it still makes sense to look at nation states <clears throat> and understand their regimes in order to make threat assessments. <clears throat> While it does not seem very community minded to talk threats, it is proper and necessary. We cannot have a meaningful peace unless it is defined by its constituent parts of freedom, justice, and order. If a totalitarian, authoritarian, or terrorist regime defines peace, it will mean the opposite. The United States is a global power with global interests that stands for a full and proper understanding of peace. It has done so in its actions and policies for well over a hundred years. It has been so in principle since the start. By global, I do not mean globalist or universal, but rather worldwide and accounting for what is going on everywhere, especially where it is most important to our interests. So with eyes open about threat assessment, how can America be worldwide 
in a worldwide foreign policy in which we do not have unlimited resources. The beginning of an answer to this question involves discerning that it is a complex world, but not a more difficult world than in the past. There is a tendency now to make it sound as if it was easier to come up with foreign policy and then get agreement or community buy-in during World War II or the Cold War. It is more accurate to say that it was differently difficult, but not easier. Real isolationism existed in some GOP and even Democratic Party circles going into World War II. In the Cold War, some Americans at all levels wanted to bury their heads in the sand. Others thought that cold warriors exaggerated or misread the threats. And still others believed that the United States caused more problems than communist regimes did. Impressively, in World War II, and again in the Cold War, the United States created an entirely new foreign policy based in permanent American principles. In our complex world, which will endure as long as human nature and interactions remain as they have since the beginning, foreign policy will always be difficult. To build the needed forms of community, speaking and agreeing upon a common language at home works best, and working with like-minded partners abroad works best. This is the community in an appropriate sense of the wor word, in a prudent application of it that is worth establishing in world affairs. This community is not a family in the sense that we have within the four walls of our respective homes. Maybe, maybe we can consider an analog to the extended family in which you see your cousins at fairly frequent to somewhat frequent family reunions. In today's world, this approach means understanding that some members of the extended family may have deeper opportunities and needs for community, such as the relatively new quad of the United States, Japan, Australia, and India, or the old standby of NATO. In this view, there is such a thing still as the free world. We are still bound by common principles and a shared understanding of politics and strategy. The free world is based on regimes that are grounded in freedom and the rule of law, as well as the pursuit of property uh, and prosperity and general flourishing. Sometimes the commonalities have been taken for granted and they must be reinforced and taught to others, including the next generations. If totalitarian or authoritarian regimes shape the current stage of world politics upon which, which nation states are currently acting, then everyone will be less safe, less free, less prosperous, less flourishing. Justice will be distorted and dispensed with. If Xi Jinping and the People's Republic of China and Putin and Russia define the international political framework, we will be less free, less safe, less prosperous, and less flourishing. If Iran, North Korea, and terrorists from regimes and sub-regimes define regional and sometimes even larger political frameworks, then we will be less free, less safe, less prosperous, and less flourishing. Community, in the sense that I have defined and applied it here, can help us face, understand, and act in a world that is not ours to form, but is ours to influence positively through prudent statesmanship. For roughly the last 20 years, US foreign policy has seemed like a land of disunity more than community. At home, a very real but relatively brief united community responded to 9-11 until this community foundered over time due to the Iraq war. Abroad over time, allies grew distrustful and wary of President George W. Bush administration's policies. British Prime Minister Tony Blair lost his job in part due to his allegiance to Bush and the Anglo-American special relationship. 
President Barack Obama promised something entirely different, not Bush, and was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009, less than a year into his presidency, due to his aspirations and to not being Bush. His main foreign policies received mixed reviews from the American people. When he started to legacy hunt, as, as many presidents do late in their terms, he moved farther away from American community in foreign relations. His big dreams, especially in the Paris Climate Accord and the Iran nuclear deal, were not mainstream American foreign policy, although he very much pleased his domestic base as well as his international cosmopolitan constituency. If Bush's and Obama's respective policies of disunity had concerned relatively small matters, it might not have mattered as much. But what turned out to be their most discordant policies pertained to large matters. Their negative presence was felt not only in the particular policy area or region, but also in rippling international effects. This brings us to President Donald Trump's term. His critics have presented his foreign policy as a break with the past, at least of the last 75 years, and a reactionary return to the America first sense of the interwar period. His supporters and some non-supporters have said, look beyond the rhetoric and focus on policy results. Based on the one term, the supporters and some non-supporters seem more correct than the critics on foreign policy. Like anyone, including any president, Trump has made missteps. <laughs> that is an understatement, correct? He is and will remain so very controversial. But Trump's, Trump's threat assessment has often been spot on. His key foreign policy successes have been significant and often strategically sound, starting with his, administration, his administration's str strategic concerns about the PRC's expansion in every area, including conventional and nuclear military, cyber and space, and US efforts to rebuild NATO, support the Quad, and establish the Abraham Accords. Uh, these are Trump's groundbreaking peace deals between Israel and four Arab states, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. There is no second term, of course. There will be no opportunity for Trump to recalibrate and to pay attention to how he presents and presides in foreign relations. In an imagined second term, a President Trump would have still injected the borough of Queens and real estate wheeling and dealing into diplomacy but he would have also relied on the leavening of friend, friendly handshakes among allies and clear, consistent rhetoric about the foes of America and her allies, all used to frame and support US foreign policies. And President Biden, Biden faces key challenges to forming community at home, even as many Americans seem to long for it. He leads a divided political party with a rising base that is much farther to the left than the American majority and Biden himself. It seems that Biden will not separate himself from key Obama foreign policies of disunity. Will Biden perform a proper threat analysis, including of China now, not as he wanted it to be 10 years ago, and of Iran now, rather than what he hopes it will be? and focus on priorities on behalf of America's national defense, especially enduring interests that are in common with our allies and therefore our larger common good. If President Biden looks closely at current threats, then China stands out. First, the PRC poses a strategic threat, building islands with military capabilities and contesting others in the South and East China Seas and exerting control over international waters, crushing demonstrators in Hong Kong under the pretext of national security, threatening Taiwan, Australia, and more countries in the region, and rapidly expanding all military, cyber, and space capabilities. Second, China poses an economic threat using its modern Belt and Road Initiative to make headway not only in Asia and the Middle East, 
but also in Africa and Europe, continuing to steal and hack intellectual property and creating massive trade imbalances in their favor as a result of acquisitions from those hacks and other actions. Third, China is a political and cultural threat as seen in, as seen in Confucius Institutes on college campuses, other direct and indirect funding in American higher education, pressuring Hollywood and other culture purveyors to change scripts and other products that originally criticized China, and worsening the US opioid crisis with fentanyl smuggled in from China. Meanwhile, human rights abuses toward everyone from the Uyghurs to Christians of all denominations run rampant in China due to its totalitarian political regime. To form community in foreign relations, the Biden administration would acknowledge all this about China, explain it directly and often to Americans and the rest of the world, and work with Congress and US allies on multifaceted strength-based policies that counter the PRC in all three areas. It would not say that everything the previous administration did about China is wrong, and it might actually build on the previous administration's policies. After his inaugural address on his first afternoon in office, Biden's first significant act as president in foreign policy was not with respect to China. Rather, he signed an executive order rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement. Certainly, this is a priority to him, for him. His administrations, the present one, as well as the one in which he served as vice president, and his party. It was his prerogative, but it may not have been his best first choice when it comes to unity. Interestingly, Biden's new Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, seemed to look for ways to build community in his Senate confirmation hearing. On issues ranging from NATO to Israel, he affirmed policies of the previous administration. And he called China the most significant challenge of any nation state to the United States, sounding a lot like the Trump administration's most important public documents on national security and national defense strategies. As well, he agreed with the Trump administration's decision to deem the PRC's treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang province a genocide. In his inaugural address, President Biden spoke of us all, Americans together, writing a story, a story of unity, not division. He received generally favorable reviews in the mainstream media and among academics and experts for this call to unity. Many, many millions of Americans agreed. For them, healing has begun. For the whole country, it would be excellent if President Biden lives up to his own call for unity when it comes to foreign policy, especially in building community properly understood at home and abroad. Thank you very much, and I look forward to some discussion. Thank you, uh, Dr. Spalding, for that terrific, terrific talk. Um, I want to let everybody know that we're going to have time for Q&A. And so if you could look at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. You're free to type in your questions there, and uh, we'll relay as many as we can uh, to Dr. Spalding. Um, I wanted to start off as we kind of wait for people to uh, ask some questions with a question for you that goes back to the beginning of your talk, sort of a question for you as political theorist. Um, this is uh, deeply interesting to me and the, the foundation you set at the beginning of your talk I thought was quite rich. And so you mentioned at the beginning of the talk that American foreign policy needs to be informed in a certain sense by America's founding principles, that, that these principles determine the interests of the foreign policy and shape it. Um, and in, in, in uh, the spirit of the Benson Center uh, for the study of Western civilization, um, you know, one thing that I think we would probably both agree about is that there's deep and rich disagreement about precisely what those principles are. And, and, and I mean that in this sense that since the beginning, uh, you know, H Hamilton versus Jefferson on, on you know, or, or something like this, uh, Machiavelli versus Kant on the Western tradition, you know, this uh, perpetual peace and, you know, you can have a global state and Kant versus Machiavelli, necessity determines everything. So in light of the fact that 
Our founders themselves disagreed about the animating principles, uh, uh, American principles, to some degree at least, and that the great thinkers of the West certainly disagree. Uh, these then disagreements rise to the top of various schools of IR theory, you know, realism and liberal internationalism and that kind of thing. And they're really just embodiments of these great thinkers of the West. And so given that that's the case, uh, and then these schools, of course, uh, uh, find their way to various presidents. And so you uh, made, uh, listed a, a, a number of presidents who have taken different approaches, which we could probably trace back to these thinkers. So given that that's the case, I'm curious how you think American foreign policy can be guided by fundamental principles when there are so many disagreements about what those principles are. And in our time, uh, those disagreements are uh, quite sore, uh, put it that way. That's right. Okay, that's a very rich question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and, and just a couple of comments on it. Um, one, this is why uh, I'm glad we had George Washington as the first president, uh, because he was surrounded by a lot of these different divisions in his own cabinet and, and among uh, others that he was interacting with um, in Congress and elsewhere. Um, and so if we look to, to him, um, and the fact that he was, you know, drawing on Jefferson and had Hamilton by his side and um, was conferring with Madison about various things, all this coming out. Um, what he comes up with, especially as um, encapsulated in the farewell address is, is our concept of, of interest guided by justice. So that it's based in, it's rooted in um, the, the basic American um, principles that are set forth in the Declaration of Independence that are codified in the Constitution. Um, and, then, and then he's trying to figure out what that means with respect to the world. Um, and, and I think that that is what I usually start with and, and certainly what I talk about with students. Um, because if you look at this interest guided by justice, it's, it's not having to get right down into the other part of one of the other parts of your question about IR theory. It's not having to get down right away into whether it's the political philosophers or the modern schools of thought of, of realism versus idealism and all the different offshoots. Um, but instead you've got this, you know, we've got our principles and it's interest guided by justice and we know what justice means because it's, it's rooted in these things. Um, so that's, that would be my brief answer to a very rich question that, that uh, you know, if we get to meet in person, we're gonna be able to sit down over lunch and talk about that at length. Yes, I very much hope that happens at some point in the future. Um, let me now stop being selfish, although I would, I would, I would uh, continue to, uh, to pick at this for, for hours. So we've got some other questions that are starting to roll in. Um, here's uh, one uh, that, you know, thank you for your lecture, they say, and they wonder whether you might be able to recommend um, some books, uh, past or present books, that speak about the topic of uh, building community and foreign policy. And this is your, your good friend, Elizabeth Eastman, asking the question, so. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth, for that question. And, and I look forward to talking with you soon. Uh, it is an excellent question. Um, I was intrigued by this uh, theme when John and you invited me to speak because uh, it's not something that pops up the way that the Benson Center is talking about it in international relations and US foreign policy. So you can go and read classics on, on it, was, it was more about building international society and, and some things about community certainly come up, but you can go and read, for example, uh, uh, the classic IR theorist, Hedley Bull, um, or you can read on the institution side, you could read what Innes Claude has to say. I mean, there, there are many, many, many people um, on this. But, but the way we are talking about it here in this, in this theme that you all have, have selected uh, for the, the lecture series this academic year, it, it's, not, it's not found because the other side now, um, it, would be, it would be those who do liberal internationalism sort of of a, um, like let's get rid of nation states or the nation states obsolescing or, you know, those people talk a lot about community but it's, it's more what I would almost call like a progressive internationalism. It's not the mainstream liberal internationalism that you had with a, a Franklin Delano Roosevelt or a Harry Truman. Um, rather, it's, it's something we can really only have community if we don't have nation states. Um, and, and so it's, it's, not, it's not written about the way um, that, that you asked me to consider, or I don't know if you really asked me to consider this, it's just the way it started working for me. 
um, when I was bringing together all the different um, aspects of what community um, might mean at home and abroad. So, so, so maybe I'll have to write on this myself at some point is the short answer. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, here, you mentioned Truman just now, and a question has come in on Truman that, that I find interesting, and uh, I'd like to hear you answer. They say, given your work on Truman, how would you assess the state of liberalism in foreign policy? And I assume they mean today, would Truman uh, be a liberal or would he be a progressive or a conservative or a moderate or a neocon? I mean, in terms of this barometer, which is ultimately right. you know, right. difficult, where would he fall? Right, right. That is a great question. Um, thank you for whoever sent it in. Um, and, and I have thought about this a little bit. I don't wanna, I mean, if you know anything about Harry Truman, if you've ever read anything about him, you know that he would not like it if we put words and thoughts into his mouth. You know, he would want to say it for himself. But that said, um, I call him overall an old liberal. You know, he was a reliable New Dealer. Um, and, and so, you know, nothing but Democratic Party politics on, on the domestic side of things. But because of his understanding of the regime, which is so very present in everything that he, he said and wrote, uh, both privately and publicly, um, he, uh, he really um, looked at what was going on in the Cold War and said, okay, this is a, a regime battle. This is, you know, communist versus liberal democracy. This is um, a totalitarian versus freedom. This is, I mean, he went through the whole thing, totalitarianism versus freedom, um, good versus evil. For him, there was also a religious dimension um, because to him it was, it was atheism versus theism as well. Um, and if he had the same beliefs, political, um, uh, historical, he was quite a historian on his own, self-taught um, and, and religious, if, if he still, if he were here at this time with the same beliefs, um, then he would be either a very old school liberal internationalist saying, what did you do to my liberal internationalism? Or he would be, there's a, a new-ish term within the last five, 10 years of conservative internationalism. Um, and he might, he might put himself in that category. Maybe he would end up being a little bit like a Ronald Reagan who said the Democratic Party left me. And then he would be reconciled with having conservative <laughs> <laughs> put before internationalism, but but um, I, I don't want to say that for sure because um, Harry Truman was very proud of of what he did at the time and proud of being you know um, a Democrat both small D and big D. A fair, fair, and a rich and difficult question, as you as you rightly point out. Um, here's a question from one of the Benson Center postdoctoral fellows. They say they'd like to return to the notion of community itself, as you, as you described it toward the beginning. Uh, they say definitions for the term are famously numerous. You've referred to community properly understood in your talk. And uh, the person is curious about whether you have a working definition in your own work for community is in its essence. And they say from, from your talk, it seems like you see membership within a community as being a positive thing for its constituents and perhaps predicated upon common agreement and cooperation. And then they cite, uh, Benedict Anderson, who coined the term "imagine community to describe nascent nation states, uh, much like our national communities today, but uh, uses different criteria to define them. So the essence of community as you understand it um, is what's being asked about. And of course, um, whether that membership is, is positive for its constituents uh, or not. Right. In, in connecting my working definition of community to the regime, I was, especially since I was talking about it mostly in the American, the liberal democratic context, the Republican small r representative context, I do see it as positive. Um, and I see it um, then as something that um, people can choose to join in. I mean, I, I don't have a pithy definition. Um, this, is, this was a new topic to me. I was thrilled to be able to work my way through it over these last couple of months. Um, and, and so I, I will keep working on a shorter definition, but a lot of what I said, um, I was putting into my understanding of community properly understood that was elsewhere in the talk. Um, but to me, it is predicated upon um, people being together in this in this regime 
that in itself is open to community. So I think there's something about it. That's why I was talking about how you can't have um, ultimately, at least by our standards, but you can't have ultimately real community, substantive community in the same way in a totalitarian or authoritarian regime. You can have people, you know, hiding and turning on the radio so that the, the, the people who would turn you into, whether it's the Gestapo or the Stasi, whoever it would be, um, can't hear you. And then you're having a private conversation with your very little local community of your family um, in a totalitarian state. But it just can't be community in the way that I was describing it for the rest of the talk from the from the American side of things. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for the answer. And if we have time, we might return. It's a, such a, a rich question. Um, here's a question from uh, one one of your uh, the, the folks who invited you, uh, the other Dr. Eastman. And uh, he says, you spoke at one point about mediating institutions, uh, helping form a community at home. Uh, this is very Tocquevillian, he says, and, and quite a good point. But there are lots of efforts from sister cities, non-governmental organizations uh, on the international stage, et cetera, that seek to create cross-national mediating institutions. Do you think people are trying to form at the international or global level the kind of community that you think can really only exist at the local or the national level? Thanks, John. Um, I look forward to seeing you with Elizabeth at some point in the near future. Thank you. Um, that is, that is, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think that this is why I said there's just a difference when you go global. So now some of what you're, you're asking in your question is, it could be in person, it could also be virtual, it could be a combination. So what does it mean to have community when, when you can't be um, together or where you, it doesn't build up to something in common um, as it does in a nation state much more um, organically um, and, and, um, and logically even. Um, so I would have to think about that more. Um, I know that there are some organizations um, where they, they are bringing people together and, and even you know, other organizations as, and, and whatnot um, and are building a kind of community. But I don't know, I would have to think on that more just because I think it's bringing together a lot of different um, pieces that, that may not go together or it would almost be niche community because much of what this is doing is, is often it's single issue. Um, or if it's something like human rights, then it is very comprehensive, but it's still not covering, it's not talking about the economy necessarily, unless it's talking about where there are violations of human rights that touch on economic issues. So, so to me, it might be something that we would then talk about as, as niche community. That's my, my first take on that. I look forward to when we can talk about it more though, John. Don't let me forget, okay? Yeah, here, here, here's another question from a, a, a Benson Center uh, affiliate, uh, one of our visiting uh, junior scholars, Alvaro Casabello. He says, thanks for your talk. It, it seems uh, from your talk that it's evident that you place a lot of weight on the nation state. And so how would you characterize the role, not of multilateral or international or even global institutions, but of corporations that seek to detach themselves from the nation state, circumvent it, take advantage of the retreat of the state brought about by certain policies on the world stage? Are these corporations co um, a competing form of community? Excellent question, thank you very much. Um, I think they are competitors um, and then we would have to talk about whether we think they can um, satisfy the criteria for community once I get my pithy definition going. Um, but um, Part of the reason I put the emphasis on the nation state is even though it's not exactly the same as it was, you know, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, it's still the main thing. So there are obviously other actors um, and corporations would be among them. And they are, they are very weighty. They have a lot of influence um, and they can have, of course they have influence um, economically, but they can have an influence as we know politically um, and, and culturally. For now, they're not as much of a um, and influence um, strategically, um, including militarily. Um, I, I guess the corporations that make the weapons can be, can be part of that. But, but so to me, the nation state is still the thing that is comprehensively doing things out in the world in a way that, that a corporation for all its power isn't. Mm, thank you, yeah. 
Um, here's a question that, that I think it would be interesting to get your perspective on. It's related to your talk. Um, and I think in the background of, of a lot of people's thinking right now. So uh, there are some who have argued that um, the COVID-19 pandemic is the first major international crisis since the Second World War, which the United States hasn't served as the global leader for spearheading an international response. Um, some may say that, whether you agree, it, it's unclear. But uh, in your opinion, will the global COVID-19 pandemic result in transformative and lasting changes in the U.S. role in the world in areas like U.S. foreign policy, global leadership, uh, China, China's potential for acting as a global leader, uh, and just general U.S. relations with its allies. So how has this pandemic kind of shaped U.S. foreign policy in your view? Right. I think, I think that is happening right now. I think there are a lot of things that we don't even know what the effects will be, um, but it is definitely shifting and changing some things. Um, and it will be very interesting to see how um, President Biden and his administration respond not only at home with what's going on with the pandemic, but also then how they fold that into foreign policy, um, foreign relations overall. Um, I think that on the threat assessment um, side of things that, that China has actually taken advantage <laughs> of the pandemic. Um, we're still getting information about its origins and and how many, I mean, we're never gonna know how many people in China actually have had COVID, um, let alone died from it. Um, and uh, and I, I, you know, we just don't know. We know people have been have been killed by the by the communist uh, Chinese for for trying to talk at it within China about the truth um, as they have been able to discern um, about about um, coronavirus. So meanwhile, though, China has, <clears throat> you know, shipped masks, coming up with vaccines, um, helping other countries. Um, and they're really leveraging something that that um, it at least originated there. Um, and so that's fascinating to me. I think that as of now, China's been getting a lot of play um, and more positive than negative um, out of coronavirus. And and they are they are the rising power. So so this is something to you know consider that way. And then in terms of how international organizations, which you do you know we all rely on. Uh, the International Red Cross or some other organization in, in crisis situations to help with things. Um, the, the World Health Organization has been sorely compromised um, during this whole process. Um, and that's a major, you know, that's a major organization. So I don't know, um, you know, the Trump administration withdrew and said, okay, we're severely critical of what's going on with the WHO. And, and so for me, the Biden administration should say, if we're gonna be active again in the World Health Organization, major reform needs to be, go on. And, and I'm, I hope that there are people behind the scenes already having those conversations, um, because I do think it would be, um, it would be a mistake. Um, and, and the WHO has tried to correct some things, but I mean, there, there's, just, there's a whole litany there of problems in, in how it was addressing um, the coronavirus. And none of that gets to then, you know, sort of U.S. foreign policy as a whole. Um, but, uh, but I do think that there will be, um, there, there are some in government now who are much more attentive. There, there was always talk in, in U.S. government and, you know, when you get to read declassified papers, there was talk about, and a pan, you know, a pandemic will end up in a list of things that you need to be concerned about. Um, but I think there will be a lot more people in U.S. government who are now watching for the next problem, um, the next potential pandemic, um, and, and saying, what do we do now um, in U.S. foreign policy if something like this happens again? Um, and, and probably, I mean, I, don't, I think a, a, a Biden administration would have been more outward um, in a um, getting everybody together um, approach um, than the Trump administration was. Um, but I don't know, I don't know how much more every, you know, the United States takes the lead and it has traditionally, but this one was something that, um, I don't know, I, I, it would have been different. It would have been different with a different president. This is where, this is where President Trump really was himself and, and didn't 
didn't even, you know, sort of rhetorically say, okay, the United States is leading on this. So that is that is something different. But I don't know, I don't know now that it'll have a long standing effect um, for future administrations in foreign policy, because was he, he had an impact definitely on foreign policy, but it was one term. Mm -hmm. the, uh, related to that there, as you can imagine, this I suspect every, I don't envy IR scholars because they all have to do what weather weathermen have to do, which is prognosticate and predict with uncertain data. But right. um, as you can imagine, um, a couple of questions have rolled in about some, some current foreign policy things um, related to this. So one person wants to sort of get your assessment of the Trump Kim Jong Un uh, soirees and whether that establishes or did anything lasting in terms of your theme, a, a community and international politics. But I'm gonna pair with it another question that's uh, related in the sense that we're asking you to be uh, do what a weatherman does. Uh, where do you place the debate over Iranian nuclear disarmament in your suggestion that the Biden administration would be wise to build up certain Trumpian foreign policy initiatives? They wanna kind of know your views about Iran, your views right. about uh, North Korea. Right. So again, since I did so much of a regime-based uh, approach to international relations and foreign policy, it won't surprise people to know that I think that, you know, starting from a position of all different types of strength is the right way to approach um, both North Korea and Iran, um, and, and they won't respect you otherwise. And, and so I'm not... <sighs> I'm always leery of personal diplomacy, which is part of what you know Trump did with respect to North Korea. Um, and so think of think of I gave the example of, of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in my talk. He was somebody who was very good at personal diplomacy, but it got him in trouble. Even though he's one of the best presidents we've ever had doing personal diplomacy, he um, he sometimes believed too much that he could make things happen through his personal diplomacy, and he didn't realize the guy on the other side is doing what he's doing and saying what he's saying, and you know all that kind of stuff. So I think I think it can only be one tool um, in the in the kit that you're using. Um, and with respect to regimes like North Korea and Iran, which have proved themselves over and over and over again. That, that you need to start with wariness and a strength-based approach of all types, you know, political, economic, strategic, cultural, um, everything. Yeah, thank you uh, for that. This is uh, a question from another uh, affiliate of, of the Benson Center, Tim Burkhardt. He, he, first of all, I compliment you on the delivery of your talk, which I second, re really nicely done. But the, he wants to return to some of the things that you mentioned about America's relationship with Western Europe, especially uh, Great Britain. Um, he's under the impression that, that you, you suggested that American relationships with these Western European nations, especially UK, aren't strictly speaking uh, genuine community or friendship because they're underwritten by shared strategic interests and shared history. Um, and he says, well, why should that diminish community? And of course, how does that affect community? Aren't friends and family members also united by shared interests and histories? He says, I have precious little in common with some of my oldest friends, but we do share a history and that's a pretty powerful bond. So we want you to kind of talk more about that. Right, I think, I think what we're talking about here is we can go back to theory now and say um, with Aristotle that there are different types of friendships. And so, you know, something can be can be useful, something can be pleasant, um, but to have it be the whole kit and caboodle to get you to good um, or excellent um, is, is actually something that is, is a bit different. Um, and so that's why I was saying you can have a kind of community, um, but I do think it's still different from, even if you have a dysfunctional family, <laughs> which we all do, <laughs> Um, that it's that the community at the at the international level or at that allied level, um, as in the question, is still going to be different from from the communities that you have with your family. You know, functional, dysfunctional, both. Um, it's always both uh, with your friends, and usually that's functional, dysfunctional, both. O other ways that you have community that are that are very intimate and close to you. It's just it's there's a difference on that. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's not some kind of, um, you know, that's why I said friendship, because it can be a kind of friendship, but, but at times it's much more based on what's useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I have, um, I want to ask you for some clarity on, on a point that came up in the talk. And, and if anybody else has any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, but um, could you say a little bit more about the connection between community and the regime? I thought, and it went by fast, but I thought at one point you were making the argument that liberal democracy in particular gives itself over to community formation in a way that monarchy for example, as just a mere regime does not. And I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that. I, I wonder if some citizens of monarchies of the history wouldn't say to you, we have community here. We, you know, and so I'm curious to, to, to hear more about the way regimes inform your understanding of community. Right, right. So, so for me in looking at history, um, obviously, you know, different forms of community throughout history and time. Um, but I'm, I'm, I think that um, it's mutual so that the individual needs to be able to fully participate. And if somebody is um, in a monarchy um, and it's an absolute, you know, monarchy, absolute monarchy, I, I didn't specify whether it's a constitutional monarchy, but in an absolute monarchy, then um, the, 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 the people weren't able to full, fully participate. They might've accepted the monarch as monarch um, but it's not the kind of equal, you know, ruling and being ruled in turn, being a citizen as we have in a liberal democracy. Um, and so to me, that means for a different understanding of community. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm being, you know, I, I think that there has to be an element there where the, um, it has to be, the person has to be able to fully engage. Um, and so it's still somewhat qualified um, for the person who lives in the monarchy who is not the monarch. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that's where I also made reference um, to, uh, there have been times where you have something that transcends. So, so let's say um, you had a community formed because of a major world religion, you know, either Christian or Muslim or something like that. Um, the, the believers, right? The, the people who, who live in that particular regime if they are actual believers, then they can say, I'm participating fully in community because my particular religion says X, Y, Z. But to me, that's different from a monarchy, you know, a political monarchy, not, not one that said, um, uh, one that wasn't religious. Now I understand a lot of, you know, over the years, a lot of monarchs were, were religious monarchs. Um, and so those would be what you then have to parcel out and talk about was that because it was, you know, a Christian monarch, a true Christian monarch, or you know, some other world religion, um, and uh, and and make a distinction um, among these? Um, and again, as I said, for me in the 20th and 21st centuries, the major distinction is between um, what we would call the liberal democratic and the totalitarian and authoritarian. And in the latter two, um, you the the there's not a real citizenship, right? The, the the person is controlled. The person is is you know enslaved in a totalitarian regime and and cannot be participating in in a, a community that's imposed on him. I think there has to be something about it that is voluntary that you participate in that you um, you know are engaged in and that it is not imposed on you. That's part of the reason I kept talking about community you know growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to will the law upon yourself, as, as Hegel would say. Well, <laughs> well, look, um, Dr. Spaulding, uh, I want to thank you for what is a very rich talk and a robust Q&A. Thank you for coming to see us. You're welcome. And, and everybody who's watching, I remind you that uh, in early February, Glenn Lowry uh, from Brown University will be talking in our uh, series on cancel culture. So be sure to look that up and register for it. And uh, thank you all for the evening. Thank you. It was a great to be with you. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Good night.